Hello, I'm going to cover a few things that I want you to have in mind when designing typefaces and their relationship with writing. I'm going to be making a few sketches and explaining a few ideas about mostly lowercase Latin script stuff. The first thing to keep in mind is the relationship of writing to type. We all think of writing as a sequence of strokes, like this, but writing is connected to. The root of writing, however, is often interrupted in movements like this or like this, simply because the tools that Western writing has been based on would not allow us to push the pencil, in this case the pencil can do it, to push a pen into the paper. So we have a more interrupted mode of writing that we move only in the look in the direction that allows the tool to be dragged. You can think of black letter type, and that is a very good example of uh, this kind of strokes. But also this applies to early forms of humanistic writing. So it's good to keep in mind the models of writing that have influenced our way of thinking about letter forms. And the first one is one that is based on essentially a broad nib. Most of you will have practiced with something like this. And this is characteristic because it tends to have a thick stroke when it is dragged and a thin stroke when it is moved sideways. And it can do this in two directions. So if we have a stroke that is written with that tool, we will have forms that take that kind of structure with thick strokes as the pen moves down and thin strokes as the pen moves horizontally. Okay. Uh, because of the angle that this would be traditionally held, this would be at an angle to the horizontal and that explains why we have typefaces that imitate traditional forms of writing with essentially Renaissance uh, traditions of writing that have these kind of angles and of course have strokes that, if I exaggerate it, would have the heaviest part at around 2 o'clock rather than in the vertical. So if we look at all stamp typefaces, this impact of a root of a tool that makes a thicker, uh, its thicker stroke in a slightly diagonal stroke will have an influence throughout uh, the typeface. That is a dominant form of writing and for training for typeface designers not because it's the only one but because this is a really easy tool to learn how to write learn how to imitate i could stick two pencils together and then i could have an imitation of that kind of stroke and see very quickly how would a letter be formed then there i've got a nice recipe for a letter without even trying very hard I've just got essentially a tool that designs the letter form for me so a lot of the European ideas about typeface design come from designers experimenting with tools like this which are easy to use they're very easy to, to train students to work and they give you a very quick recipe for how to do forms that have the correct let's say distribution of thicks and thins what is important to keep in mind is that this is, at its heart, an interrupted form, which means that as I go down the stroke, then I lift my pen, come across, drag across and come down again, and that will help create a thin stroke there, and it will also allow me then to lift my pen and write across, which what I would do is I would write a serif across. So the earliest manuscripts from North Italy have these kind of uh, structures of an in stroke that comes down, an interruption to the stroke coming round, cross stroke coming down, interruption for the series moving on. And what we think of as round strokes would be written in multiple strokes coming something like that down and then another stroke coming down and that explains why we have a lot of these that have a thicker part there for these older typefaces. But what we see here that's created is again this thinning of the stroke there and this very strong 
impression of the lifting of the stroke from the baseline. So a very clear indication of style. This is a dominant way of thinking about letter forms and uh, pervasive even today. Extremely helpful because if you're unsure how to structure your typeface, this model of a simple inclined broad pen will give you a very good recipe. However, uh, from the 18th century especially, we have tools that have a steel nib that allows us to have pressure sensitive strokes. So it doesn't matter which direction the nib is being uh, held, but actually it can change the thickness of the stroke depending on the pressure we apply. These are much more difficult to use. Uh, they take much more training and one of the reasons that they are not used as much for typeface designers to practice is exactly because there is a uh, uh, an, an expectation of a lot of practice before people can use them but if we look at typefaces that have a lot of curlicues a lot of connections to the forms that are quite smooth and gentle and maybe have ball terminals that connect to forms and so on then these tend to have roots in these kind of forms. So something like this could be dragged and pushed upwards, could move down and then up, and of course you could do all the things that we associate with uh, decoration in the 18th century and so on. So the idea of a very uh, controlled thin stroke that can change very smoothly thickness into a heavy stroke and then again uh, come back into a thin stroke from this very smoothly comes from this steel tool that allows us to have control of the thickness of the stroke regardless of the direction in which it's moving but this is actually a difficult technique so what we have is an influence of this style in uh, 18th century typefaces we can see a lot of moderns that do use this uh, in a uh, continuous style of writing to to typefaces with the introduction of ball terminals and so on, but uh, they are not as dominant for a typeface design today exactly because the source tools are not so easy. They are a reference that is stylistic that we can use later. The third model of writing has to do with tools that are agnostic and I am using such a tool right now because the pencil doesn't care that I am left-handed, it doesn't care which direction I'm holding it, pulling or pushing, and indeed any kind of uh, nib that is symmetrical all around and maybe has a continuous flow of ink or of graphite, the regardless of the direction that I'm moving it will function like that. So a lot of these tools lead to 20th century forms that appear to be modular and imitate geometric forms and hide the differences in speed or impression uh, or direction of holding something that uh, the tool might have. So the pencil creates a form that then doesn't tell you whether it's been written slowly or quickly or uh, from a left-handed or right-handed perspective. And this is very much a 20th century model that leads a lot to then constructed forms that take these kind of shapes and essentially clean them up into things that are much more geometric. To uh, people who are a bit more minded for tools of writing, these also relate to engineers' tools uh, that gradually eliminated the impact of the, uh, of, the, of the pens and led to very precise drawing. The fourth model of uh, creating letter forms has to do with essentially a very modern idea of construction that is synthetic, that is something that sees letter forms as constructions that are made up of elements. It's very much based on sampling. It's something that is very close to our idea. And it might be something that is based on real forms. So we might have a combination of something that is uh, by some real forms that then are combined. Uh, so I have something that looks like a starting stroke that I could make with a tool and has a exit stroke that looks like it could be made by 
a nib or a brush, but I can also have entirely artificial uh, elements, like for example a serif from Swift, or a stroke that looks like it's made from an imagined brush, but then actually has an exit stroke that is entirely geometric that would be impossible to make with a tool that leaves a continuous mark and can only be made as a construct form built up of discrete strokes. So these kinds of shapes that are very much a 20th century product, they come from the refinement of the idea of letters as designed elements, things that are constructed from uh, patterns or paths that are built up and then at their heart are essentially deconstructions of movements of forms. They are abstractions of letter forms rather than letter forms themselves. They are much more, let's say, intellectual objects, things that carry with them decisions about the references to other things rather than uh, something that directly references a tool. So that is quite important for us to keep in mind and this is the area where a typeface designer really operates today where we are in a fairly postmodern environment where the designer is aware of the influences of the shapes they bring into something and also they can do it with the full sense of the references they are bringing into the process. So it could be something that is consciously referring to historical sources and also consciously distorts them and plays with the meaning that this creates. So that's the first thing to keep in mind. The second thing to keep in mind is the impact of optical sizes on uh, how we should think of letter forms. And uh, our tools are actually quite bad at this because they tend to see uh, things as simple paths from which they can interpolate uh, between extremes of shapes. So for an application like font level glyphs, this is essentially a continuum of shapes that is entirely ignorant of the sizes in which things will happen. And here I might have a quite thin eye, and here I might have a very bold, heavy eye, and the application has no concept of how these will be used other than the names I might give to the fonts. And that is actually a problem. In reality, what I've got is an axis that we can think of as an optical size axis uh, that uh, for all intents and purposes would be measured with the apparent size of let's say the x height at the scale at which we are reading. So let's say if this is my regular uh, this is about two to three millimeters height at the reading size. Reading size means here's my eyes and here's say 30 to 40 centimeters and here's my, my phone, I'm holding my phone and I'm reading. So at this size, at this distance, the letter forms appear to be about two and a half millimeters high at the X height, which means that then if I'm holding a larger device, say a tablet, I could be holding it further away, uh, but I could fit more text in with stuff at the same apparent uh, optical size. So as far as I'm concerned, the, the, the optical size of the typeface hasn't changed. So we will see that often the physical size of the device or the book for that matter uh, is not really that important. What matters is uh, what is the actual size of the typefaces uh, that appear to us. It's useful to mention here the, the dictatorship of print design, which determines through some uh, very undemocratic process that say reading sizes for this language will be say 10 to 12 point in these typefaces which might correspond to this measure of two and a half millimeters for the x height but then we will see readers dynamically bringing books closer or further away essentially changing the optical size uh, of the typeface in relation to their preferences simply because the device the book doesn't do it for themselves, whereas a responsive device like a tablet or a phone will do it for them. So if we think of this and have our nominal reading size at about two to three millimeters uh, optical size, this is our, say, our regular zone 
this also means that this is the zone of immersive reading. So this is where we are reading continuous paragraphs, things that uh, requires to do immersive reading in a sustained uh, way. And reading also happens as a social action here. This is where my memory of texts that I've read comes into the reading process. Also my memory of the content influences the way I respond to the content of what I'm reading. So it's a, a lot of what uh, let's say the research about reading for adults, free readers, is about is in this area. However, uh, this is what we would think of as a regular for typefaces. This is this convention of what we think of as a regular in terms of darkness, uh, typeface occupying a certain amount of space on the visible page and so on. However, if I bring these things in, I will see that actually I might have a light and a heavy weight and the light will never be used for continuous text in paragraphs. Uh, maybe only for books printed by architects, but that's another thing. Uh, so the light will always be used, say, for editorial design. I want it to represent some headings or some mastheads or maybe uh, on a website it's a bit of branding or even on the size of an airplane it says some sort of branding. That's just a few words. In this case, I have something that will be optically much larger in size so it might be somewhere there in terms of how large it would appear to me uh, from several centimeters up to something that is meters high. And essentially I have much less text. So what I see is that as I have uh, a larger, sorry, uh, a lighter typeface, I will tend to see it being used at larger sizes and also for less text. And the same thing will happen with bowls where if I have something that's quite heavy, essentially I have something that might be for a poster that says uh, vote now or something like that, but the text below will not be in that weight. So again, I have this phenomenon of the extremes in the weight not being used in the typographic environment that the regular is being used, but in very specific circumstances. In small text, just a few words, these would be just a few words headings, this would be even just a single word or just letters, packaging and so on. And the reading situation is completely different. Here I'm essentially decoding the letters almost as symbols, as indeed would happen with a logo, rather than letters for immersive reading. That means that when I'm making decisions about a typeface, uh, I merely need to focus on this, which would mean something that is maybe a light regular, um, something like Elena from Process Type Foundry would be a good example, uh, to something maybe a bit chunkier, which might be who, uh, a good Scotch Roman perhaps, and up to a semi-bold. And somewhere in this zone of a light regular to a semi-bold is the area of comfort for reading immersively. And anything above this then becomes either hierarchical bowls for list elements, uh, navigation and so on, or something that's for display use, or here it is for branding, logos and identity use and so on. So typeface design for typography really happens in a very narrow space and everything around it is for very different typographic environments. That's important to keep in mind because the type design applications we use want us to uh, think of things as a continuum interpolation, that maybe the regular sits there and the black sits there and the light sits there and that they are interchangeable. Uh, this is not the case. The way people uh, produce documents and the way people read actually requires us to think of this as a separate area of working and then these two as, let's say, the cousins of this typographic space that will be designed later. That is quite important point. Now, uh, somebody might be thinking variable fonts allow you to design this very uh, around this problem by introducing uh, an optical size axis that will take into account the typographic density, uh, differences in spacing and so on. That is indeed true, but the type design applications we are using now don't allow us to do this very well. Last thing uh, to do with relation design is to look at the uh, specific decisions, the sequence of decisions for forms. Uh, 
So the first decision to look at has to do with the stroke. I'm going to just draw a line here. So this is my baseline. If I keep in mind what are my basic uh, dimensions, uh, the first thing I want to do, uh, there's my x height, is how am I going to fill this space? What is the proportion of this stroke? And a number of you have uh, landed on reasonably good proportion for this. Some of you are edging on the light side. The best way to answer this is to look at typefaces that are occupying the genre that we are designing for. Say, for example, continuous literature, news on a phone, and so on, and see how dense they are. And what we'll find is that things are uh, between 1 and 5 and 1 to 6. So it's 1, about 5, or 1 to 6. So we have a set of proportions here for our lowercase stroke, which gives us essentially uh, an avatar for that pen that we talked about that leaves a certain thickness of the stroke. Yeah. So you could imagine that I am writing with a certain pen and I'm moving it down five or six times the width of the nib. That's how this would work. The second thing to keep in mind is how much white space do I want in here? Again, our idea of regular determines what we think is acceptable in terms of the width of the letter forms. So in most uh, typeface for text, this might be somewhere between, say, twice the size of this, 175 to twice the size of uh, this stroke. So I might have another stroke position somewhere there, and that will give me the step, the frequency of uh, the letter forms. If you remember the uh, the presentation about the frequency of letter forms, then you can see the importance of this pattern. This gives me the rhythm of the typeface. We also talked about how these basic proportions change gradually over time as designers select maybe slightly wider, slightly narrower typefaces or lighter typefaces as the technology increases. And indeed in recent years, as the resolutions go back, go, go up, we've seen a slight move towards a little bit lighter typefaces for regulars, but also a little bit narrower typefaces so we can actually get more stuff into a small screen. So what we have now here is another stroke. We're still not doing any design here. There's zero typeface design in this. What we've done is a typographic investigation into what our readers expect to see in terms of the, the density of the form. So the first design decision we're making has to do with this bridging of the stroke. Are we going to do something that has a shape like that or something that has a shape like this and so on. So this shape might have an apex there, this shape might have an apex there. Essentially now I'm referencing those tools where I was saying I'm having a pen at that angle and I'm, as I'm moving it, it has more weight there or I'm having uh, maybe a, a nib where I'm having a gentler, more symmetrical stroke which has smoother transition between thick and thin and has an apex right at the top. You could then even say that actually I'm moving through time by the shape of this curve and this is say 15th century whereas this is 18th century and essentially by the positioning of this apex how symmetrical this curve is I'm determining uh, the historical connotations of my stroke. So maybe I will choose something like that to give a little bit of movement distress to indicate that this is an interrupted stroke because I will want to have more of a corner there. That's my first decision. The second design decision is the relations of the outside to the inside of the stroke. And here I'm now furling the 20th, 21st century because if I were using a single tool, there is no way to have much variation there. I would still have whatever I did, I would have a single way of doing this. I would not have any tool that allowed me to produce things like this or uh, something like this or a lot of things that you are imagining. So the idea of a tool that uh, imitates a form of writing but actually tracks differently on the inside and on the outside is a physical impossibility but it's entirely conceivable in a postmodern typeface design environment where we are deconstructing our tools. So there I might have something that is fairly smooth or I might have something that has 
more of a corner and amplify the certain tension that I want. Uh, the examples I showed you with Duggins uh, earlier on the stream uh, make use of this, of a much more predictable and let's say uh, smooth outside and a much more aggressive inside. That is a hint also to the importance of the inside counter, that the outside tends more to reinforce the connection to the genre, whereas the inside tends much more to reinforce the individuality of the typeface and the feel I want to give. So if I want a feeling of angularity, like some of you are playing with in your typefaces, I would tend to have a smoother outside, but then a more angular inside. Uh, so now I've begun to start making design decisions. The next design decision I'm making is how I'm going to treat this in stroke. Is it going to be something that has uh, quite a strong prominent serif? Is it going to be something that has a lot of bracketing or not? And here I'm in entirely deconstructive mode where I can pick and mix forms. I could maybe choose something that is 15th century with a very strong top serif, uh, but much longer and thinner bottom serifs, uh, perhaps even asymmetrical serifs. Something like this that indicates a movement uh, from left to right, or I could have something that is much more symmetrical, simple uh, in a sense, and also has a similar stroke at the top. So again, I can think of uh, historical connotations there, something that's more symmetrical, uh, both left to right and uh, x height to baseline is more like 18th century, this is more like 15th, 16th century, and I can see a difference in these. So even if I look at typefaces uh, that are fairly recent, like say Bram de Duce's typefaces, uh, from the early 90s, there is this hint of a written form that has a direction, a movement, and that is an entirely constructed element. There is no real movement there. It's just something that is imparted in the typeface by having essentially an asymmetric serif that hints to us a movement. And this relies on us being conditioned to interpret a certain form in a particular way. What uh, we'll have to do by jumping back again into this idea of uh, our optical sizes diagram is the realization that at the typographic scales that we're working, serifs need to behave in a certain way in order to remain visible. So then if I want things to stand out enough at certain optical sizes, I need to have a certain dimension here and here. And that's important because if we go back to uh, our drawing, this is where typography happens, but calligraphy happens somewhere there. So calligraphy happens at larger optical sizes. If I am writing something like diploma or something like that, then this happens not at a space, or a size that is typographic, this is in purely written form and so on. And you can see your own handwriting happens at forms that are between one and a half and twice the normal typographic sizes. So what I've got there is essentially a recipe for the sequences in which I will make decisions that are either about typographic genre or my uh, decisions as a designer for how to give personality to the typeface or again jumping back to the decision about the optical size of the typeface I will make. And once I've made these, I can kind of scale these into others. Now, if you're thinking what you've just done the end, well, if I've decided that I'm going to have essentially an interrupted form like that with a heavy stress there and probably a corner there, then my D will also be an interrupted D where I will have a corner there. I would have a higher stroke at the bottom which will imitate this kind of stress that I have in 15th century typefaces, I will probably have more weight there to imitate what goes on there, and an outstroke. And I can decide whether to take that corner from there and maybe play with it by adding a hint of it there, or maybe on the outstroke at the bottom. So I can pick up a lot of hints from this and bring them into the rest of the typeface. One last thing to cover has to do with how do I translate this into nodes. Now, one important thing 
when I am making outlines uh, is to keep in mind that again I have to make up for the compromises because all this time I've been making these shapes and things like that are actually very easily continuous and have a very smooth transition between what looks like a flat space, a quite tight curve and there a very gentle shallow curve and uh, if you have a look at the uh, document by Dwiggins I sent you uh, he has a wonderful long stroke where there is not a single straight line but everything changes in small ways so here I've got a problem because if I want to translate this uh, into points the only easy thing to do is this which is a straight line maybe here uh, so here I will probably have another point and maybe have two control points there so that I can push this a little bit in if I want to have a bit of a gentle push but now here I have a much more complex curve where I have something that theoretically I could produce with just two points but what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a control point there so I have one pair of points controlling the tight part of the curve and one pair of points controlling the shallow part of the curve that means two things that first of all the points have an easier structure if I want to make small changes here I don't have to worry about all of this the other is that if I want to have different weights in this letter form and I might have changes in the curve I will have in place then another point there that will allow me to have this shift in weight and control the change in this curve much more confidently if I do have a lot of uh, width changes in the family then that thing is absolutely essential because then I might find that I need that point to control how straight or how curved this part will be and how tight this will be and if I move into very thin strokes then definitely I will need to have that point there because otherwise that stroke will be just far too challenging to handle with only the two points so what I'm going to do as a principle is think that I have not only a pair of points for each curve with the arms at the same side, but I also give control arms to curves according to the rate of turn of the curve. So tighter curves, I give them a pair of points so that I control the curve with similar length arms. And then the shallow curves, I give them another pair of points so that they are handled on their own. That's the first point. The second is that if I have something that when I was making it with my uh, with my tools I would use an interrupted form say if I'm doing an N and I'm doing that or if I'm doing an A and that's one stroke two strokes or three strokes four strokes yeah then I would imitate this in my uh, outlines and I would have outlines that imitate my uh, sequence of writing and there that's one outline that is one movement and then at most I'm uh, sorry at least I would have another outline that maps onto that stroke uh, if then I want to have a more component based approach where maybe I have a terminal that is repeated somewhere I might have a, a third element there and so on but I would always go back to having as many outlines as I have uh, strokes so for the end I would tend to have as a minimum one stroke two strokes and then have the serifs separately now there are different preferences uh, by a number of designers some designers might want to put the serifs to have with a little bit of uh, foot at the top uh, it depends a lot on how you're treating the stroke I would tend to uh, even if you like to use a lot of repeatable components tend to not do this too much because this allows me to be more careful in how I uh, handle uh, differences between similar but not identical elements so there I've got some basic recipes for point structure and so on. Uh, another thing that you could do is when you are uh, sketching and you've got your letters 
prepared, you could uh, go over it and say, okay, I'll make sure I have a point there, a point there, point there, uh, point there, and then I know that I want to end up with this number of points for my uh, form. So when I scan it in or take a picture and put it into glyphs, I've got this ready to go. Uh, there you are. So it's a few, uh, just a few pointers uh, for us and uh, I will catch you live uh, shortly.